Good evening, guys. So yeah, it's very close to Halloween and also it's very close to end of October. I wasn't expecting the Houston Astros Braves World Series, but here we are. And also as a little surprise for you guys, there'll be no slide deck tonight. That's we're gonna go back to old school, just pure code. This is Algos and Ten season two, episode eight with Jason Liu. And tonight to make life a little easier, I actually split the um, Teen Titans problems into five different notebooks for parts A, B, C, D, and E, five parts. And of course the other two, uh, stable matching and bipartite graph solution. Also with a little Java pseudocode, this show could do more than just Python. Without further ado, here is the coding solution for episode eight. And this episode is sponsored by, of course, the uh, Major League Baseball and also with the stable matching. So by uh, Tinder, which is pretty cool. Anyways, here's the um, episode. I'll start sharing my screen. As you can see here, I have all my notebooks nice and organized over here. And I can begin the episode. So we begin with very simple stable matching. Um, this is all based on episode seven slides, which we've already gone over in previous episodes. So if you want to review stable matching, the general definition and algorithm, you can just look at the slide deck. So for stable matching, it's an algorithm that determines compatible matches between two sets. For example, not necessarily dating or marriage related, although that is basically what stable matching is sort of used for nowadays. For example, such as my Dell job, we have called mentors and mentees. So each new hire will be assigned a mentor. The mentor's job is obviously prepare the, um, you know, the new hire and the new mentee, the onboarding. And basically how we determine how to onboard the mentor mentee. Well, last episode we went over an algorithm that basically ran three, four loops of like, and mentors and M mentees, and we do like each different rounds, accept the onboarding relationship, reject onboarding relationship, or defer the next available. However, this is assuming that why um, it's not going to always work, because it's a caveat. This assumes that neither N or M is not two more or less within each other. And now I'll give you a better illustration than last time with an actual line that will help you understand why I did, I did it this way. Let's say we have, example, a line of M mentors and N mentees on Zoom right now, for example. And let's say the activity is because it's Halloween related, it's trick or treat. So let's say, for example, mentor M wants to basically teach mentee N how to do trick or treating for like onboarding or something. And then eventually it gets to the point where we have the last mentors. Let's say this mentor is already occupied and is already occupied. They have one more mentee over here, lonely little mentee waiting for a mentor. Well, this algorithm does not work because you will have this, at least one more mentee just being, you know, big sad, just waiting for the mentor. However, if you even have just one more mentor available, then the mentoring mentor algorithm will still work because there'll always be at least one more mentor than mentee, hence the n less than equal to m relation. Now with that scribble aside, here's the actual code. So here's the coding solution. I did use a bit of a gist, you know, from GitHub, um, set your sources always. And I basically did the following. I made four mentors and mentees because it's easy to illustrate with just four and four is a fantastic number. I made a deep copy of each different mentee list, mentor list. I converted to data frames using Python pandas, which is a classic data science way to do things. And then I essentially made permutations of each different types of mentor mentee with, of course, duplicates allowed because this problem set is different than the original because actually I'm allowing duplicates this time to make it easier to run Gale Shapley. Then of course I checked both data frames to look good. And I didn't exactly run Gale Shapley because this took me a while to figure out. <laughs> It's a tough algorithm, it's a leak code medium at least. But essentially what Gail Shapley does, it gives you like a mapping, a BFS mapping between like, um, you know, mentors and mentees. So there are a couple of um, straight comments that I need to take care of. But uh, otherwise it's pretty, pretty straightforward. So like, it's just, you have a group dictionary, you have deferrals, deferring between mentor and mentee. You got different types of um, choices. 
So this is like very straightforward, just basically go for each mentee and mentee list. If they're not already deferred, make them available and then find the best choice here recursively. What makes the algorithm sort of hard to understand is this portion over here. So this is what we call a lambda expression in Python, which means it's like an anonymous function. It's like a, you know, like f of x equals x, x plus one. But say you can have lambda x equals x plus one. It's like a substitution for like a function. And this is an example of call by value, by the way, for like programming terms. So what makes this interesting is that when you have a lambda function, you can just directly call the value instead of like saying, for example, if something, 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 then something equals something. When you with something like this in Python, you could just simply directly say if condition A, condition B, then condition C. You know, logic is cool. And then of course you want to avoid double asking between menus and mentees because repeating is, you know, for noobs. And then finally, you get to have an anonymous variable to store all the mentor deep copies. So before I tell you the solution, here's a quick little verbal quiz. What's the runtime of this thing? And if you've learned any algorithms right now, you should know this is cubic, one cubed. This is why I did not run it yet, because this will take me a good 10 minutes. It could be spending time learning about Teen Titans instead that I don't want to waste. And I also want to watch the World Series a little bit. So yeah, this is Owen cubed. The reason why? Well, very simple. We have one for loop, which is Owen. We have another for loop, which is another Owen. We have a while loop, which is O of M, because um, you know, it's the mentees, mentors, M. And then the total, of course, is going to be O N squared M. If you want to make it amortized, it's O N cubed. There we go. That's your solution. Always make sure your runtimes are polynomial for these solutions. And not only just the lead code, but even in the real world, even in my Dell coding, like if you give a solution that is like two to the end, good luck. You can spend all day waiting for that job to run, and my manager will not be happy, and you'd be wasting time. So make sure you definitely make sure your algorithms are like within polynomial time. This one is actually sort of cutting it close. I could have done, you know, dynamic programming as I mentioned here with stable matching, but I have a life, you know, like I'd rather do something more interesting in my life anyways. So I'm not going to do that. Um, it's obviously very, very uh, time consuming to do something like that anyways. So that is the stable matching. I run iterations and I run Gale Shapley. So you can take it from my word. I'll definitely share on GitHub the solution code. You can write it for your own self, but it does work to go Shapley the algorithm. All right, problem number two. I know Red Sox already won the ALDS. Boo, they lost to Houston, the ALCS. Doesn't matter. Let's just pretend we're two weeks before and we're still watching Red Sox and race. Um, we know, yeah, the series is tied 1-1. One, one, and we apply the two node by bipartite, um, two color node bipartite matching algorithm. So as a little quick refresher, here's what we're basically talking about. You have nodes here for the Boston Red Sox, nodes here for the Rays. And the Red Sox, which I'll use in red, um, basically have like multiple matching because they have such good pitching, they have like Chris Sale and everybody. So like this is the Red Sox, this is Tampa Bay, the Rays. So basically what you want to do is like determine which games will the Red Sox win and which Bay will Tampa, which game will Tampa Bay win. And of course, as in real ALCS, it's like a reverse sweep. We basically won series three to one. So for Rays fans, I'm sorry, that's just part of life. Anyways, that's basically what I want to go for. It's like show you guys the mapping. Now the coding is actually very interesting. The coding was quite difficult to test. So I decided to reduce it just only three pictures each. Let's, for example, say Chris Sale, Erod, and Nick Pavetta or something, or, or Nathan Yavaldi. And here is like the Tampa Bay pictures, top nodes, bottom nodes. So I only add the edges between opposite node sets because you know within by part I imagine you cannot add nodes in between adjacently. And here is the Hopcroft algorithm, which um, from the website toward data science. It teaches you like how to use Edmund Karp's um, matching algorithm to give you the optimal result. And in a bonus episode of Algorithms in 10, probably in December, I'll talk about more of these matching algorithms. 
But for now, let's take it to black box admin card. And I have a really good function here called obtain min weight match, which basically finds the minimum weight matching for each remaining ALDS game. And I basically randomized the uh, edges here because I wanted to make it a little more interesting than one, two, three, five, six, five, four, five, six. Instead, just make it more interesting. And of course, it's a Boston Red Sox sweep in this one. So it has here to determine who wins and who loses. If game one is won by Tampa Bay, or game two won by Tampa Bay, or game two won by Tampa Bay, the Rays win. If the Red Sox win, then the Red Sox win. Otherwise, the series is over because nobody could have won the games in anything more than five games for ALDS. There's only three games remaining with five games total. You already had two games used up. So five minus three equals two. There you go. There's some math for you. So yeah, and I also showed in a data frame the Red Sox win. And now, me being a bit of an overkill person, I do this in Java as well. So for Java, it was a little more interesting. I had to actually use the number of pictures to six. Because in Java, if you use only three, you run into some array issues, array um, allocation issues. And I basically used the bipartite matching Boolean function to determine if every pitcher in ALDS can or cannot win the game. And then, of course, because it's a DFS function, it's like a tree, going down a tree of wins and losses, it gets into a little bit of AI, which talks about alpha beta pruning trees. Let's say, for example, this is the Boston Red Sox winning, and uh, this is the Tampa Bay Rays winning. So you have two ways of this tree going. You can have either Red Sox beating Tampa or Tampa beating Red Sox. They can now continue this to another Tampa Bay game or to continue another Red Sox game. So you can see already how this is going to go, right? It's basically going to turn into a tree. So I'm basically going down the tree, um, you know, like in order traversal going down this alpha beta tree. No, this is not about alpha dating or beta dating. This is just a form of tree AI, which I learned from Vue undergrad. And actually shout out to my friend Alex Moisey for working with me in this um, class. It's a nice little throwback to game theory, which is really cool. So now back to the code. So I run basically a DFS recursive algorithm each picture in the bipartite graph. And of course, in the end, once all the games have been played, they return false. And then we finally determine the massive number of games the Boston Red Sox or Tampa Bay can win. So you use basically an array to keep track of each game. You count the pitchers assigned to each game. And then if you've already seen the pitchers win, you can't win twice to have the other pitcher win. And if I were to have more time on this, I would actually have done some unit testing on the uh, max BPM and on the BPM functions. And I actually would do as a base case, just one game, one game ALDS, basically like another wildcard game. And then for the recursive case, just do as much as I can until the World Series. That is something we call ex extrapolation, which is something I'll talk about in the final episode. Finally, uh, this, you can see the code is quite repetitive. So we can actually do a design pattern called a factory design pattern, which I learned from the FSC in our, at Northeastern. A bonus episode, which is basically all algorithms and 10, like, you know, extra goodies and bonuses and stuff, in December, probably around Christmas, will show such refactoring. So it's always good to refactor code if it gets too long or gets way too repetitive like this. I see like a bunch of for loops, if loops, like if, if conditionals, I could definitely do better than that as like a Dell code, a Dell engineer, and of course, as a master's graduate. So. <laughs> if you give code like this at LeetCode, do not expect Fortune 500. They will want you to you know, refactor the code. Just like building, for example, a nice little gingerbread house. You want to make the house stand up. Yeah, you want to make the house stand up, but also look good as well and be function. So it's an art. This type of design is an art. That's why they put computer science in BU in a, in a school college of arts and sciences, not college of engineering for a reason. Finally, some Teen Titans stuff. So yeah, I talked about Slade. So I basically gave you guys a cliffhanger last episode. What happened to Slade, right? Well, I now have a solution in five different notebooks. So let's jump to that right now. First solution is pretty simple. It's um, k-means. So you have Robin eating ice cream. You know, if he's not terrible, he could actually get very, very ill because he doesn't like kryptonite. However, his antidote to actually fix the illness. So you have the confusion matrix of like um, Robin's, you know, good bars, bad bars. 
You have the imports for PCA, which of course is very important. So here's a question for you guys, quiz number two. What does PCA stand for? That's right, principal component analysis, which means basically you divide your data into components and analyze them. Easy. So we have MP array, we run a PCA with components of just two, but they only have good and bad bars. We can then just basically run in some samples and features. Always do a two to one ratio because it'll give you a better value. And this would look in this signal type of graph, basically shows an interpolation graph of like the different features. Now we plot the clusters. You already knew this is going to be a clustering algorithm episode, so you, you're not surprised to see the word plot. In fact, when you think about cluster, make sure you think about plot. Is a cluster without a plot is like basically going to the World Series without a manager. You're missing a very big, big component. And back in the BU years, I made a big mistake um, in regards to doing one of, my, one of my projects. I forgot to add in all the plots in my first draft of the assignment, got a 50. <laughs> I add in the plots, aced it. So this is like a real reminder in the real world to not forget what's important. So we have a bunch of values um, for guys to k-means. And then finally, I can show you a nice looking plot. So yeah, it's all blue, which is cool. But the blue dots really show between PC1 and PC2. So PC are the principal components. For this one example, may say maybe Robin, you know, getting sick. Or this one say maybe Robin getting healthy. I don't know. But what's the most important thing is here to determine closest values. And do not worry, this will be on my GitHub. So if you think I'm moving too fast with my code, I'm just trying to get through the episode as fast as I can. So don't worry, you can spend your sweet time looking at this code once you see it on GitHub. Anyway, you have the uh, determine closest values, which is using the Hamming distance. So you guys remember from geometry, right? Back in like high school, or in my case from WA, you have something called a Pythagorean theorem, right? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Now let's take the square root of these bad boys. And this is where you get the Hamming distance. C equals, well, since you have basically positive negative, of values a squared plus b squared. So that's the reason why you have Hamming distance to power two, because it is based on Pythagorean theorem. So geometry aside, that's like how you basically determine the Hamming distance. As a good exercise, actually, for you guys, if you want to review how to actually use math in Python and actually use the um, round function, you can actually write your own Hamming distance function. For me, since I want to be lazy and just get watched the whole series, I decided to basically just square and call it a day. And of course, I round to double sig figs because that is what we do. We, we round to the lowest significant figures when it comes to distances. It doesn't make sense to round to the nearest, like, I don't know, nearest, like, uh, 10 thousandths when it comes to, like, small distances. So just two sig figs is good enough. And of course, I used a dot head to like show the first 10 values of Python data frame. And of course, because this is the best way to make Robin avoid getting sick, the least amount of fake bars Robin can eat and avoid being sick is 10. And there you go. There is problem one being solved. All right, problem two, a little bit of a uh, tribute to my own Dell work with mainframe. I'm gonna obviously not say what I'd be doing at my Dell work because that's confidential work, but I'll just simply tell you what the topic is. So there's something called allocations in the mainframe software. So basically, Slade is trying to trick Cyborg. You know the guy with the, um, yeah, you know the guy with the computer head and the, uh, you know the tech stuff. That guy, yeah, Cyborg. So Cyborg is stuck in a maze and he wants to get out. And Slade has given us the following data sets: twenty bits of east, forty bits of west, ten bits of north, and thirty bits of south. And of course, to visualize this, you just think about the stack, you know, because stacks are where memory, memory lives. And that's a systems concept that many people should know if they're a computer science major. So you have 40, you have 20, 40, 10, and 30. So this will make you already think about the OS system right here. So it's like the Slade OS. So basically what you want to do with the Slade OS is allocate memory just big enough 
that eventually Cyborg will be able to get out of the maze. Because every time Cyborg takes a wrong turn in the maze, memory gets used up. And of course, if he uses too much, so it will put him to sleep, which is bad. So he wants to get at least two times the recommended distance from the starting point. So to continue on this algorithm, we're going to first, of course, import PCA and sklearn.decomp. And then here is basically what we do. We put in the slates, you know, array. We convert it with a list comprehension. We make a new copy of the array. So we can actually run PCA. We run PCA on this bad boy. We get another looking, you know, interpolation graph. And then we don't need to make close to plot here because we're doing distance calculations. So let me ask you guys yet another quiz question. What's the smallest amount of components you can have to still run PCA? The answer right in front of you is two, because you cannot run PCA only one component. You cannot compare to anything. So there we go. It's only two. Two is the smallest you can make it without making it, you know, biased data. So yep, there's your k means. And now once again, we have a variation determined closest value. So you can see I am I am very much a self um, a, a, a person who, who likes to recycle his code. Not plagiarize, recycle. That's right. It's called being green with the code. Like not using your code like repeatedly, it means you just don't know how to like, you know, design your solutions. Like reusing your code and understanding what it does and changing it up is very important. Because oftentimes in time coding challenges or even in the real world, people don't want to reinvent, reinvent the wheels. You want to just keep on using what you gotta use. So this time, because we're trying to find bigger distances, trying to get basically, you know, Sub cyborg out of a maze, we had to do 1,000 values ahead. And we calculate the average to compare, and the recommended distance is basically the maximum value minus the average. And if anything is greater than recommended, we append it to that list. So, yep, cyborg runs that, and there we go, we have the values. And then the bit lengths that cyborg must take to save the maze of doom are these bit lengths. So, the smallest it can be is 5170. So it must take at least 5170.51, well, almost 5172, um, 5171, sorry, a uh, total bit length to, uh, to basically escape the maze of doom. Now, this is the pathological case. What happens if you have basically an array of zeros and only one 99999? Well, then just take the only, the only exit out. That's it. All right, part C, Starfire, the ladies, you know? So for the ladies, Slade's going more down the dinner date route, you know, how to, um, yeah. So Slade is obviously going to make Starfire eat a bunch of pizza. And, you know, pizza is delicious, don't get me wrong, but if you eat too much of the wrong thing, it'll, it'll give you stomach pain. So Slade directly is going to use stomach pain against Miss Starfire over here and, and on the Titan's pizza to trick her. You can see I am really enjoying some Teen Titans from the Hawaii trip. I don't even remember some of the plot lines here. Anyways, um, now I, I have a new thing called a Gaussian mixture, or it's called a GMM for short, Gaussian mixture models. Now, I also have something called stratified K-fold. And the difference between that and regular K-fold is the fact that stratified gives you the best value from your model selection. In the final episode, coding episode for Air Priori, I'll actually talk about my um, data mining course, Stratify Cable Solution, and see how that applies to MP reduction to vertex cover and set cover, I mean, independent set and vertex cover. And of course, because pizza is always made out of blobs, and the blobs of cheese, pepperoni, and I don't know, pineapple, you can have make blobs episode. <laughs> So if it's eating pizza right now with this episode, I am giving it a lot of props because it's not easy to code while eating pizza. Anyways, here's some delicious pizza code um, of pepperoni, cheese, pineapple. I know people always have a bit of a war over, should we have pineapple or pepperoni on a pizza? You know what, just put them both together. It's not like, it's not like um, a binary choice, you know, just put them together and eat your pizza. All right, and then I also have a data set which basically makes the blobs. And you can see I'm making it with two values of topping and pain point. Our job is extremely simple. Maximize the toppings for starting to enjoy, reduce, minimize the pain point. 
And of course, choose the best value clusters. So I have that for pepperoni, I have that for cheese and pineapple. And now here gets interesting. I can actually do clustering incrementally. So I begin with one GMM of just only one cluster, which is, of course, good old pepperoni. You can see from this cluster, it doesn't look very good, right? It looks like Starfire is taking a lot of hits here, which doesn't look like pepperoni is a very, very good ingredient. It gets better with cheese. Now, cheese does a way better job. You're going to see it clearly separated into two clusters here, which is great. And of course, pineapple is absolute king. You have three beautiful clusters, almost no chance of risking pain point here, and delicious topping over here. As I mentioned, it looks like Starfire is sick, with most of the topping being pineapple, some being pepperoni, and a few of it being cheese. However, safe is not always safe. You have to verify it. So to verify it, we've got to actually fit the models. And that's where the um, Gaussian mixture stuff comes in. So this stuff over here takes almost a semester to learn from data science. I don't expect you guys to be Gaussian mixture experts. We do need to know two very important parameters in here. This three, which talks about the number of samples you're going to run for the, for the k-means, and this dot fit thing, which is basically trying to fit your data to a model. So you basically run GMM for all the different topics. And then, of course, you do label encoding. So here's another question, if you guys understand what it is. What is the difference between one hot encoding and label encoding? Yeah, so one hot encoding does not mean encoding is super hot. That's not the answer. One hot encoding basically means you can only have one too many mapping. Well, label can have many too many mapping. That's the answer. And it's something called a BIC and AIC value, but in the interest of time, we're not going to cover that. We're going to cover that in the finale episode. And if this, of course, if time permits, because I myself don't remember what these values actually mean. So I myself am learning some stuff every day. To create the predicted data, you set the labels of predicted data, and now they make a much nicer looking cluster here. You have every single one of them much more nicer. And so now you can see definitely pepperoni is not good. You have Starfire basically having like massive, massive stomach pain over here. This is just gonna be terrible for her. But cheese is a little bit better. You at least have some sort of choice. And look at that beautiful pineapple. These are almost all the choices in the world, almost like more than half of it to avoid pain point. So in the end, Starfire is super safe if she basically just, you know, eats um, pineapple, some cheese, and almost no pepperoni, which is actually quite a delicious pizza. It's very healthy for you. It's a lot of vitamin C, some solid calcium, and not too much fat. So Starfire is a healthy eater. I, I, I respect that. Anyway, this just shows you right there, our original prediction was wrong. It was actually wrong, which is weird. But, this is what happens. We miss it and understand what needs to be a cluster. Many people think usually, including yours truly, thinks the cluster means, okay, a trend tells you what, what data points are in that trend. That's not correct. That's not a cluster. What a cluster is, is a collection of data points that actually predict a trend. So that is very important. That's something that actually a lot of data, data scientists can really mess up and even computer science majors in general. Like, it's one of the first things you have to be careful with when working with clusters, is knowing which part is which. Of course, and then BIC is the Bayesian Information Criterion, and AIC is the Akaiki, weird name, Information Criterion. So we're gonna show some of that crazy stuff in the end of 2020. All right, now the other lady, Raven, Shady Centroids. So Raven is basically put in a circular room. So I'm gonna draw quickly what she's dealing with here. You have a circular room here, right? And you have a bunch of different things. You have a bunch of different doors. It reminds me vaguely of the Dunning Philosopher's problem. Only one of them is a proper exit. The other one, basically she's in trouble. So she cannot go to any other door. So this is almost like a game of Wheel of Fortune. Raven basically spins the wheel and hopes to get lucky. With one caveat, the values are randomized, they're not predetermined. So to really show randomization, I first basically choose a bunch of numbers that represent the doors that Slate put Raven in. They convert into a sublist with you know, another list comprehension, 
I convert this to an array because when I try to do this without an array, I ran into a lot of Python errors. Always make sure you know what data set you're using or data structure you're using when you're doing Python, always, because if you don't, those errors can really give you a good, good amount of stress. And of course, convert to data frame for, for reference, second PCA, you know, get that look, nice looking interpolation graph again. And this time I do some, some mathematics. So I determine the number of features by summing all the doors and times the length that reach features. And the reason why I do that is because of dimensionality, which is a linear algebra term. So for example, I have a line here, right? That's just one dimension. Now let's say I have a line, a triangle, that's two dimensions. And of course, I want to really get fancy at three dimensions, Rubik's cube. Wow, it's actually a great looking cube. So yeah, a cube is essentially for three dimensions. So the cursive dimensionality basically states that the higher the dimensions you go, the more and more likely errors will increase. And in terms of this case, your features will probably go wrong. So to reduce dimensionality, I need to make sure that all the features are not gonna be any more than the maximum amount that they can be. If that sounds like gibberish, then look up you know, dimensionality reduction. So yeah, that's some very advanced math stuff, but it is important to understand. And anyways, here is the permutation of the doors to really trick Raven. And then this thing I low key may have, you know, attributed to somebody else, but it basically says like, you want to zip the two lists together. So zipping lists means basically merge them together, but by values. So, like, you know, zipping like, you know, like your jacket, zipping your jacket up and down, it zips up the two arrays a lot like that. The, the values of the arrays line up in a one-to-one -one mapping. And of course, it makes some nice k mean centroid graphs. So these little red X's over here are centroids, which is like the center of a cluster. So think about as like, you know, basically as your brain, the brain itself is X and the neurons that connect your brain to your body is all these different um, clusters. Of course, this is Halloween based. You can imagine this to be like a Simpsons transport type of thing. So um, yeah. Um, hopefully you guys can sleep all well night after that. And of course, I have another algorithm called centroid calculation, which is great. You can find the average doors by summing the random bars and the lender random bars. And then basically the doors for Raven to escape the entire maze is between a range. The reason why I don't say a specific value is because it's randomized. So you're not guaranteed which value, but as Raven says she sees that door, she's gonna just walk right through and get out of the maze. And speaking of which, I need to walk right through Gavin's episode. So let's go right to the final one. And shout out to Mr. Beast for this, um, for this, uh, for his work. It's really, really great. It's actually quite inspirational, um, Mr. Beast. So shout out to you, bro. Anyway, to finally wrap up this episode and to actually show how just how crazy clustering can get, this is an actual legit Kaggle like project, basically. So the final part is essentially a whole problem in itself. So Slate puts Beast Boy, you know, that we turn into different animals, different types of, um, different types of creature. Into animal, this is into an animal of his, of his own choosing. So Slate uses a biological and zoological confusion to try to trick Beast Boy. So to trick Beast Boy, he basically like puts him in a zoo, right? And although the Beast Boy can escape the zoo, you know, as a dinosaur, gorilla, dog, cat, and even falcon, he's not guaranteed to beat Slade, because Slade could literally just, you know, you mind, mind control manipulation and basically keep him in there. So to help Beast Boy win, we got use something called a dendrogram, which is like a tree structure for different creatures of, of Beast Boy. And of course, the very famous heat map to figure out the problem. So this problem is huge. I use like almost like 15 imports here. Once again, another great example of reusing your code, just copy paste your imports. And then I also give you a nice little blurb what the dendrogram actually does. It's usually a tri structure, so like a tree with labels. So for this thing, I'm gonna spend my sweet time. This will take you as a while, so bear with me. You have animals, a dinosaur, gorilla, dog, cat, falcon. You have different mappings based on the length of each animal name. So dinosaur has eight letters, gorilla has seven, dog and cat each have three, and falcon has six. 
you convert each element into an array, you convert to MP, and do the same trick you did in part D, great. Now we convert to data frame. That's super simple. That is super simple. Here's what gets fun. So usually in arrays, you simply use dot merge, right? With pandas, you have to be careful. You're, you're, you're merging based on their indices, zero to four, not their values. And that's where it gets complicated. So instead of merging, what you do is called concatenation or concatting. And just a string concatenation, for example, hello plus world, right? You just want to basically concatenate table plus table. So as a quick example, let's say it's table one, table two. So you want to concatenate them to be something like this. Table one and two combined. You want to concatenate them to something like this. We have combination of the, of the tables. It's not an append. Append is putting it on their rows. Concatenate is putting it on their columns. So make sure you be careful with the terminology when working with data frames. Otherwise, you're going to get to run into a lot of errors and a lot of frustration. So you can imagine why I've spent almost two and a half weeks since the last episode making this thing. Well, it's just that hard. You have to be careful what you use. So anyway, I make a bloody crazy Halloween um, interpolation graph here. It talks about the interp interpolation of um, you know, the different values. And then of course I make another, you know, permutation of these values. And then I make the cluster. And this time I make it much more cooler because I actually use um Seaborn here. So this is the cluster that Baseboy works with. And now we're gonna make five blobs because it's five animals. And each blob we're gonna basically have two types of values animal power and something called slate effectiveness. Basically, how well can Beast Boy defeat Slade and how much power will he have as an animal to defeat Slade? And once again, it's a very nice X to Y mapping. And I use cluster here to actually show how many clusters it will take to defeat Slade. So these are the values. Now, some of these values could be negative, could be positive, because we're basically determining them based on absolute values. So we're assuming all the slate effectiveness are negative, this means Beast Boy loses the, the battle. And anything that's positive, of course, Beast Boy will win the battle. So that is good. So anyway, we continue on, we do the plot, we make the clusters, and look at the beauty here. I made the clusters red here, then blue, then red, blue, green, then red, blue, green, orange, and finally red, blue, green, orange, purple. And dun, 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 there you go. We just basically made the five node cluster colors that represent the Teen Titan colors. How cool is that? So clustering is very fun once you start visualizing. It's like playing around with the colors and knowing what you're doing. I used to sort of hate on clusters because it's hard to understand the concept of it. But once you actually draw them, it's like Jackson Pollock in computer science. It's just putting random dots in and, you know, have fun time enjoying what you created. But now back to serious business. So we continue with some GMM stuff, which is really the same as before. So this time we use covariance type equals full because we don't want any false positives. We wanna make sure Slate actually gets defeated. So yes, we're gonna use that. And we continue with the GMMs here. We use labels again. This time we actually use the, uh, the label encoding and we set the labels. And now we could just actually do three colors because we already eliminate the dog and cat given the previous values. This time we actually do predicted data here. And we see um, Falcon's looking good. Dana's looking good. Gorilla, yo, that looks amazing. That looks almost perfect, you know, like green, red. So obviously Gorilla wins. But how do we make sure that Gorilla wins? We gotta make sure it's a dendrogram. So these values here are the animals. Zero, of course, being the dinosaur, one being the gorilla, um, two being the dog, three being the cat, and four being the falcon. You can see they're labeled based on effectiveness. So clearly one being the gorilla wins. And then of course we can actually label the animals in letters here. And there you go. And I could use the heat map and there you go. Slate is defeated, he has history. The gorilla will easily win because look, 0.7% winning is this nice looking, you know, skin color, uh, skin color color uh, for the heat map. Now this heat map is really unique. No meaning about heat mapping, but you know, those, you know, different like matrices type of thing. 
But with something called random under sample, we can only have one dimensional heat map, which is like, I mean, two dimensional heat map, which is like rectangles. Once you get into more into seaborne, heat maps get a little more complicated. So I'm not going to talk too much about them right now, but just is a cool way to show you how your, how your data gets like distributed. So yeah, Slate is done and we are good to go. So Slate is history end the episode. I will show you all the code and all these notebooks in my GitHub repo um, relatively soon after the episode is aired. So of course, um, Halloween is coming up on Sunday. So to go over one of the most scariest and mathematically complicated um, algorithms possible in algos, we go over the median medians or the mom of all horrible algorithms. Why median medians is so horrible to even code out and it's a real horror story, it's a real Halloween horror story, is because you have to work on it recursively. You're talking about basically like, like 72N over like 13 or something. It's, 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 it's just, it's just it's a fraction hell when you deal with um, median medians. But it's quite useful to know about. If you really want to review um, recurrence relations, this is a great time to go over it because it's all about recurrence relations in this uh, horror episode. Recurrence relations by themselves aren't bad, especially with the master theorem. But when you add it to median medians, it can drive your mind crazy. So to make it not too crazy, I'm going to actually only use fractions that are actually like solvable in my head. And of course, after that, we have episode nine on Veterans Day. And we honor airplanes and the veterans using basically what I used in my data mining course. I've also introduced finally MP uh, completeness by basically choosing some existing MP problems of graph coloring, independent set, vertex cover, three set or satisfiability, and even Hamiltonian paths and the traveling salesman problem. Yes, those are actually reducible to reduce it to item frequency and item data set mining. So yeah, that is basically it for Algos in 10, episode eight. Uh, episode in 10, season two, episode eight with Jason Wu. And of course, guys, stay safe this Halloween. Trick or treat, wear a mask, and let's go Braves for the World Series. And also make sure you guys like and subscribe. Thank you very much.